we're getting ready as the local church here to go through the elder selection process. It may be that we don't even appoint a man, and it may be that we do. But we need to understand as the local church that it's good for us to go through the process, the elder selection process, every once in a while, just to be able to keep these things on our mind even though we may not appoint someone. Because what we do when we go through this process is we remind ourselves of the importance of having elders in the local church. How the every local church needs elders, and in every age, the local church is going to need men to lead and guide the flock. And as we go through these, this process, we remind ourselves of who the Lord wants those men to be. The qualifications that are given by the Holy Spirit still apply in the 21st century just as they did in the 1st century. So as we look at these qualifications and we talk about the work of an elder, as I'm going to today, then we remind ourselves of what God desires an elder to be. The qualifications that He wants the man to meet. And even those of us who are not qualified to be elders now, we can be working toward that one day so that we may be able to serve the church if there need to be a need for us to do so in the future. So that's why we would go through this process, even though we may or may not appoint a man. As you see, my purpose today, as has been asked of me as the, of the elders here, is to talk about the work of an elder in the local church. I realize that, generally speaking, lots of people, lots of brethren, have their own opinions of what the work of an elder is. But you know, it doesn't matter what I think the work of an elder is, and it doesn't matter what you think the work of an elder is. What matters is, is what God says the work of an elder is. And that's my purpose today, is to go to the Word of God and let the Word of God tell us what the work of an elder is, because He knows better than anyone else knows what that work should be. And I hope this is going to encourage us and remind us of some things that we need to have on our minds especially as we, we go through this process. i got four things that I want us to talk about this morning as we work through this. Uh, so let's, let's open our minds, let's open our Bibles, and let's search these things out together. First of all, the first thing that I want us to see is that the work of an elder is the work of overseeing. And if you have your Bibles open there to Acts chapter 20, we see this. And I want to set the, the context with verse 17. Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. He calls for the elders of the church of Ephesus to meet him at Miletus. Verse 17 says this, From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. So he calls the elders of the church at Ephesus to meet him at Miletus because he doesn't want to take the time to stop in Ephesus. He's on his way to Jerusalem. Remember, that's the context. He's speaking to the elders of the local church at Ephesus. But notice what he says to them in verse 28. As he's speaking to them and Paul says he knows this is the last time he's going to see their face. And he's got some parting words for them. Verse 28, he says to the elders, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Elders are superintendents, if you will, over the local church. We all understand what a superintendent is, don't we? Let's just practically illustrate that. A construction company has a big job going and they're, they're building a large structure, large building. You've got a lot of people on the job. You've got a lot of different things going on within that job. But they hire a man. They may even hire a group of men to oversee that, to watch over that job, to make sure everything goes the way it's planned to go. That's what a superintendent would do. Well, elders of a local church do much in the same way, spiritually speaking, if you will. But what we're talking about is not one man, but we're talking about a plurality of men who work together, who oversee the work of the local church. That's what Paul is calling these men to do here. But he makes it specific that they oversee as shepherds going before the flock. Elders aren't cowboys. They're not behind a herd of people driving them in a certain direction. No, they're depicted as shepherds. What do shepherds do? They lead from the front. They lead as an example, and they're leading the flock in the way that the Lord would have them to go. Look at the first. Leave your marker here at Acts 20, please. 
And let's come back now to 1 Peter chapter 5. Notice what Peter has to say, speaking of elders, in 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Peter writes, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Look at verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Notice here that we, we see something that, that needs to be pointed out. He tells these local elders, wherever they are, he said, you shepherd the flock of God which is among you. Did you catch that? Elders of a local church, their oversight begins and ends in the local church that they're among. It doesn't go any farther than that. The elders that oversee the work of this local church here at Gardendale, their oversight begins and it ends among this group. It doesn't go any farther. And that's what Peter is pointing out here. You shepherd the flock which is among you. These men were among this flock of God's people. They oversee as shepherds. And Peter depicts that also. They follow the chief shepherd. If you went on down here in 1 Peter chapter 5, Let's look on down and pick up at verse 4. He says, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So who's the chief shepherd in this context? That would obviously be Jesus, right? Jesus is depicted as the chief shepherd. So if there's a chief shepherd Jesus, then the elders of local churches are following the chief shepherd and the flock is following their shepherds of the local church only as they follow the chief shepherd. The chief shepherd is leading all other shepherds in the way they need to go, and the flock that's among them, being the elders, is to follow them as they follow Christ. And they're overseeing that flock in the instruction and the guidance of Jesus. That idea of them being shepherds is a, is a very good depiction. People in the first century certainly would have understood that, especially in the area that the Jews lived in that area of Palestine. There was lots of shepherding that went on in those days. But I think we understand enough about the concept to be able to make the application to ourselves. Shepherds leading the flock in the way they have to go must make sure that the flock is, is fed the proper food. A shepherd had the, the oversight of all that flock of sheep, and they had to eat. They had to drink to stay alive, didn't they? But he had to feed them with the proper spiritual food. Come back again to Acts chapter 29. It's the same way when it comes to elders of a local church. They have the spiritual oversight. They're shepherding people, making sure they're fed with the proper spiritual food. And this is the reason, as Andrew pointed out last week in Ephesians chapter 4, that you have that term pastors among those teaching positions in 1 Peter chapter 4, 11. All of those teaching positions there are there to equip the church to do their work of the ministry. And one of those that's listed in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, is pastors. But that's the same word that's used in Acts chapter 20 for shepherds. Pastors in the Bible is talking about that plurality of men who have the spiritual oversight of the local church. It's not talking about what I do or what Andrew does. We're evangelists. We're preachers. We're just preaching the word. But pastors are men who work together to shepherd the flock, to oversee it, to make sure the flock is fed with that spiritual food that they need. Why do they need to make sure of that? Well, guess what? If not, the flock could be poisoned and eventually die. Did you know that, just speaking of, of sheep generally, that there are certain types of plants that if a sheep eats, they'll die. It will kill them. It's toxic. They will drop just like that. And that's true with lots of animals. I used to have horses for a long time. There are certain things that a horse cannot eat or it will kill it. It's the same way with sheep. Now, a shepherd had to be mindful of that when he was shepherding a flock, didn't he? And if he took those sheep out to pasture, he just couldn't allow them just to eat anywhere or eat anything. Why? They'd die. He had the responsibility to make sure they were properly fed. What about the shepherds of a local church? They're to make sure that the flock is properly fed. Why? Because if they get the wrong thing, they'll be poisoned. And Paul warned of that. Acts chapter 20 again, beginning in verse 29. He told these elders to take heed to themselves and to the flock. 
For this I know, verse 29, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will arise up speaking perverse things to draw the disciples away after themselves. You see the point there? He says, look, there's going to come a time, guys, when men are going to rise up and they're going to teach people stuff that's not true. They're going to teach them things that are false. And if they believe those things, it's eventually going to poison their minds and their hearts and it's going to lead them to spiritual death. And it was the responsibility of these shepherds to make sure, to watch, to warn, to make sure that the feeding that was done, the spiritual feeding, was that proper type that would keep them alive spiritually. Overseeing as a shepherd, furthermore, would also involve soul watching. And we, we can infer that from what Paul says here, but look to Hebrews chapter 13 with me, if you will. Please leave your marker there in Acts chapter 20. We will come back to that. But in Hebrews chapter 13, as the, the writer to the Hebrews is giving some, some practical exhortations here. Notice what he says in verse 17. As he's speaking to these people, just about some general exhortations that they could apply to themselves. Verse 17 says of chapter 13, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Now, when you read that passage, who would that apply to better in the local church than anyone else? I've never been able to read this passage and apply that to anyone else except the elders of a local church. It is those that I'm to be submissive to because what are they doing? They're watching out for my soul. Those who are leading me. Well, what does he tell us about their work here? Well, they watch out for my soul. They're watching the souls of the sheep that they're watching over. And if you're a member of this local church, you're sheep here. And you have shepherds who are watching out for your soul. But the, the gravity of this, I mean, look, look at how serious this is. He says to these men that your work is to watch out for their souls. And furthermore, God says, you're going to give an account for that. One day you're going to stand before the Lord and you're going to give an account for those souls that you had the responsibility to watch over. That's heavy, isn't it? I don't think that, that we take that to heart as members of the local church, as we should at times. When we have men, as we do, who are striving to the best of their ability to, to have the oversight of us, to keep us on the path of righteousness because they love us and they want us to go to heaven. I don't think that we look at their work like, like we should sometimes. And maybe sometimes we make their work harder to do than it should be. And he gives a warning about that to us as well, doesn't he? Let them do so with joy and not grief. That would be unprofitable for you. He gives both sides of equation. They're going to stand and give an account for the work that they have to do, but you're going to give an account for the problems that you gave them if you did unnecessarily. So let me just say that in passing, that we need to understand the heavy, important work that they're doing. And as far as depends on us, let us make their work as easy as possible. Because I don't think we understand what it means to carry the souls of a local church on your shoulders and be responsible for them. But these men have to understand it, don't they? They have to understand that they're going to stand before the Lord one day and give an account for that. And what's that going to involve? Well, it's going to involve some hard stuff, isn't it? That means that there's going to be times that they're going to have to step up and address disorderly conduct in the local church. They're going to have to... Uh, hurt some feelings sometimes, not because they want to be rude and not because that they dislike someone, but because the Lord just commanded it. Let me take you to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. It's on the screen. Verse 6 says this. Paul writes to the church there, but we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. There was an issue in Thessalonica going on. And Paul says, look, in light of this issue that's going on, you're to withdraw from any of those who are not doing the things that God asked them to do. But if that's the case for the brethren generally, who should, whose radar should that be on first and foremost? It's the elders, isn't it? The ones who have the oversight of the local church, 
the ones who are called to lead them in the path that they should go, if that's their charge, then it should be on their radar first and foremost. Because remember, they're out in front leading us. So if there's disorderly conduct that has to be addressed, who are the first ones that are going to know about it? And who are the ones that are going to call it to our attention? It'd be the elders. It'd be those who have the oversight. It's a sad case, and I've seen it, unfortunately, in the past. It's a sad case when the brethren understand that there's such a situation in the church, but the elders don't have the courage, nor do they have the want to, to address it. And that's sad, because what's it doing for the rest of the flock? And it's leading us in the path that we don't need to go. At the same time, they must actively seek the strays. There are going to be times when people wander away. Sheep wandered away from the flock. You remember Jesus used that as an illustration in Matthew chapter 18. I'm not going to ask you to turn over there right now. We should all know that. But he said, what if a man had a hundred sheep, but one of those sheep went astray? How does that man handle that situation? He leaves the 99 and he goes after the one in the mountains who's gone astray. And when he finds that one, what does he do? He rejoices over that one stray more than he does the 99 that stayed in the right place. And he goes on to say, Jesus does, that this the Father's will, that not one of His children, little children, be lost. If that's the Lord's intention for every one of us as individual members of the local church, the ones that are given charge to watch over them, how should they feel about those who go astray? I'm not saying they can get every one of them back. That's not always possible. But when members of the church fall away and somehow just disappear and wander away, it certainly should be on their radar that we've got to go out and we've got to seek these lost people and try to restore them to the best of our ability. Now, they may entreat the help of someone else in the local church, but it's certainly going to be on their radar to do so if the Lord intends for not one person to be lost, then He would want those who watch over their souls to be concerned about them going astray. That certainly would have to be part of the work of overseeing. But at the same time, you're going to have people who are going to never leave the pew. Are they? You're going to have brethren who are going to be faithful and they're going to keep coming and attending services and they're going to try their best to do what they need to do. Well, I, I, I said it like this. It may not be the best way to say it. But shepherds watch over souls in order to keep them safe. These, the people that are are continually just trying to fight that good fight of faith and, and be as faithful as they can be, don't they need to be fed too? They need to be reminded of who they need to be. They need to be encouraged. They need to be motivated. They need to be fed those things that keep them a balanced Christian who's not top-heavy or lopsided on one side or the other, if you will. You know what that's going to take on their part? It's going to take observing teachers within the local church who teach. Elders need to observe every man that stands up and teaches God's people. They need to know their effectiveness. They need to know what they're teaching and how they're teaching it. Why? Because of what Paul said in Acts chapter 20. Look, it's not like we live in an age where that can't happen here, and we hope it never does. But the men who have the charge to oversee the flock of God must know who's teaching the church and how they're doing it. That's essential. Why? Because it, doesn't just, it just takes just a little bit of feeding the wrong thing to poison a mind or poison a heart. And before you know it, that person has gone astray, or before you know it, it's led to more people. And I think that would also involve those who have been brought in to teach. Can we just use the example of gospel meeting preachers? We need to know men who are brought in to teach God's people. We need to know who they are, what they've taught before. That may not always been possible as, as easy as it is. How do I say that? It may have not have been as easy in the past to do that as it is now. But we have enough technology now. We have enough live stream and sermons on websites now, we can go and we can listen to a man and know what a man stands for and what a man preaches. I think that's important. If the only credential we give someone is if they went to some school somewhere, that's not a credential enough. 
We need to know what the man teaches. Does he teach truth? Does he stand for the whole truth and nothing but the truth? And I think we need to examine that and make sure of that. And so would it be men who stand before the flock. Paul said this to the brethren in Romans in chapter 16. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. If he's warning the church in Rome to be on guard for that, then how much more should those who have the oversight of that local church be on guard for those things as well? If not, then why not? Elders have the work of overseeing the local church to make sure that church functions, spiritually speaking, as God intends for it to function. Secondly, let's talk about the work of ruling. What does it mean that elders have the rule over the local church? Well, if you're still here in Hebrews chapter 13, we see in verse 17 that the first sentence of verse 17 says, Obey those who rule over you. So obviously, this in a context where it's talking about elders, the writer says that they have rule over the local church. Let's look back again now to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Turn a few pages over. And notice what Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and in verse 17. Here in a context where he's dealing with elders of a local church, he says in verse 17, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. So he says, now the elders of a local church, and I think this is his point here, all elders should rule well. That's not a question. And those who do rule well can be counted worthy of double honor. That is, they, can, they should have the respect of the local church, and they can be helped monetarily. They can be supported for the work that they do. R elders who rule well should be respected by their brethren. I mean, that's an honor that they deserve. If you've got men who have dedicated themselves to watching over the flock of God, have sacrificed their time, and you can see that they're diligent in doing that, they deserve my respect. They're watching out for my soul. And I don't want to give them the hardest time I can give them. I want to help them. They've got enough problems to deal with. And in dealing with all of these problems, the Holy Spirit asks them, hey, I need you to do that well. They're all expected to do that. But what does that mean? Well, I think the term, term rule has to do with having charge over. And I think that we, we see that in another passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12, that, that speaks to overseers here and it answers that for us. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. That answers the question there. What is this idea of ruling? Well, they're over you in the Lord. They have charge over you. And because they have this charge over you, they have this heavy responsibility, esteem them highly for the, their work's sake. What's their work? Well, the rule. But I think we can better understand that when we look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 within the qualifications. Because this idea of ruling there is illustrated with a father ruling his house. It's not my purpose today to preach on the qualifications. Andrew, Lord willing, is going to do that next week. But I just want to use this part of the qualifications to make the point here. Look at chapter 3, beginning in verse 4. One of the qualifications for an elder is to be, verse 4, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Do you see the point there? This is a man who is leading his house in the way that the Lord has asked him to do so. God has asked men to lead their households. Men, listen to that. That's your charge. That's your responsibility. You are to be the leader in your home. And you are to lead your family in the pathway of righteousness. Your leadership should be seen in a way as where your children, who are obviously going to be Christians in that home, because he compares it, that if he can't lead these people in his home, how can he lead the church of God? 
So if he's going to lead Christians in the church of God, it's obvious he's leading Christians in his home, right? Well, those Christians who he's leading in his home, they must have a sense of respect for him, for his leadership. And having that sense of respect for his leadership, then he can lead them to have respect for all authority. Parental authority, civil authority, and most importantly, authority for God. There's the illustration. That's the type of rule we're talking about. A man who leads. He leads his family in the path of righteousness. He leads with godly leadership, and he's respected because of that. Elders should have that too. And elders deserve that if they're doing that in the way that God's asked them to do so. And again, let me say from 1 Timothy 5 that they're expected to rule well. If you're, Let's just take that a little bit broader for a second. Are you a Christian? You're a Christian and you're expected to be a disciple who does things well in sight of, of God and what He's asked us to do. Elders are no different. They've been given a duty. And they're to take that duty and to rule well in regard to it. Let's talk about some things that, that, would, make, that would, would make that up. It's ruling well. I think it means having vision and perception. Remember back in Acts chapter 20? where Paul told them to take heed to yourselves and to the flock? Because what's going to happen is there are going to be people come in who are going to try to rip it apart with false teaching. They're going to try to lead people astray. Well, those elders knew that at that time, but it hasn't happened yet. What would have been the best thing for that group of men to do? They would have been, the best thing for them to do would have been gone back and to talk about that. Now, Paul said that apostasy is going to come. There's going to be some people who are going to rise up and try to tear this church apart. Now, how can that happen? Let's talk about that. Let's be perceptive here. What are some things that we can put in place to try to guard against that? I think it's a good idea, personally, for elders to be able to sit down and talk about all the problems that they can perceive in regard to the local church and just kind of think ahead about how to act upon that. I know there's going to be some things that you'll never see coming. I know that. But there are some things that we know that generally happen among churches all around all the time. And I think it's a good idea for those men to sit down and with godly wisdom, come up with a plan for that if it does take place. That way when it happens, we're not floored, are we? we, we we've got somewhat of an answer as how we're going to handle this because we've talked about it. We've got vision now. We've got foresight. Not only for the bad things, but for the good things too. What are some things that we can put in place to make this a strong local church? Let's talk about those things we can do for the future. And I think that's what Paul was trying to teach the elders there at Ephesus. I think ruling well means being aware of the flock's needs. If you're in Acts 20, let's look at verse 31. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Why was Paul warning? because he knew there was a need that was going to arise for these people to be stable and be strong. There's always going to be a need for the Lord's people to be stable and strong in light of the world that we live in. We're always going to need to be fed completely, to be balanced. You know, it may be sometimes that a local church doesn't, doesn't have what they need. They may be lopsided. I've, I've come into local churches in the past and you know what? They didn't have everything they needed as far as teaching was concerned. Now, I can't say that about this group. I think we, we're trying to do the best we can to be balanced in our teaching. And I think we are. But that doesn't mean we need to quit. We need to keep on keeping on. But elders are those who have the pulse of the local church. They're striving their best to know the needs of what's going on. They're trying to be aware. They're trying to know, is there a problem here? Is there something that we need to know about? Does something need to be strengthened? Well, let's make sure we provide that. There's a need there. and We don't want this to be a lack that's going to lead to problems in the future. We've got that focus that's looking ahead. They're to rule well. They're to be firm. But they're not there to lord over, are they? Remember, elders aren't dictators. They're not up driving people in the way that they want them to go. No, they're shepherds. They're leading people in the way the Lord wants them to go. Peter said that in 1 Peter 5 and verse 3. 
nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Remember the chief shepherd's in the context. You're following him. Wherever the chief shepherd is leading you, you shepherds are leading the flock in that direction. It's not about what you want. It's about what Jesus wants. And you know at times, it's going to be difficult. Can we just take the pandemic of 2020? I'm glad I wasn't a shepherd in the pandemic of 2020 and now the pandemic of 2021. But you know, there, there, there were some decisions that had to be made that couldn't be forceful, opinionated decisions. We came to some crossroads at times that not everyone was comfortable walking through. Now, it may have been that some people were like, let's go, we need to, get, we need to cross this road right now. But some people weren't ready. What if the elders would have said, you know what, some of us are ready to go. Let's go, everybody, let's get, now let's get down the road. But everybody just wasn't ready to be there. Let's go back to the sheep and the shepherd in the pasture. He's moving his sheep somewhere to, to new ground. And he comes to a water crossing. And it's a little bit rough. It's coming downhill, downstream, it's rocky. It's just a little bit rough. The water's rough. And not all the sheep want to go across. Some of them are hesitant. I just don't know if I can cross right here now. I, I, they're just afraid. What's the shepherd going to do? Can he make them go across? No, he's going to lose those sheep. No trust there. You know what that shepherd's going to do? He's going to say, you know what? All of these sheep aren't ready to cross right here. Let's go down this way and let's find a crossing where everybody can go across. That's what good shepherds do. And when it comes to matters of opinion like we've had to deal with this past year, our shepherds found a place where everybody could cross and we all could stay together and worship God together and be unified. That's what shepherds do. They don't lord over in what they want us to do. They, lord over, they, they lead in a way that will lead the flock to unity. That's what ruling means in this context. Let's take that a little bit further. This will be my last point on on this point. But if these men are going to rule well, they must communicate well. They've got to communicate with one another constantly. Can you imagine a group of elders who don't talk? Oh, how's that going to work out? How's that work out on the job if you had four superintendents over a construction job, a, a big construction job, but none of those men communicated? How's that going to work? Well, that job is going to fall apart, isn't it? It's going to be in pure chaos. Well, when it comes to the local church, if you've got shepherds that are watching over God's flock, spiritually speaking, if those men aren't communicating, there's going to be problems that arise, isn't it? These men are going to be in constant communication with one another so they can be aware of what's going on among the brethren. They must be in constant communication with the evangelist as well. You know what? Preachers need to know what's going on as far as what they need to know. It helps us at times. We don't need to know everything. But there's some things that we do need to know that will help our work. And when, when elders are in constant communication with the preachers there, we've got a unity going on that helps us be more effective in the work that we're doing. When they allow us to know what we need to know, we can better act in situations where we can be a help. And that communication keeps us more glued together to help us effectively do the work of the Lord. But let me say this. Elders need to be in constant communication with the flock. The flock needs to know as far as what they need to know is concerned from the mouths of their elders. They need to know that, hey, you know what? Here's what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it. And we're trying to do our best to keep us on the path that we need to go. I think if we just use this past year as an example, our elders did a great job of that. And when they communicate to us and they let us know what they're trying to do and why they're doing it, we're more on board with them, aren't we? We can understand what's going on in the background and we're going to better help them try to accomplish that purpose for the whole. But when communication's not there, we can't do that. Here's the most important. 
Elders need to be in constant communication with God. Well, how are they going to communicate with God? They're going to go to Him in prayer, aren't they? I mean, the most effective elders are going to be prayerful elders, aren't they? Men who are constantly going to God in prayer for that wisdom, for that, that guidance from the Word. And there again, there's communication as well. How's God going to communicate with them? Every time they go to the Scripture and they remind themselves of who God wants them to be. When communication breaks down, brethren, everything breaks down. But when elders communicate well, elders will be able to rule well. And they will, by example, be able to lead us in the path that we need to go. Thirdly, let's talk about the work of teaching. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2 tells us that in the qualification list there, that an elder is to be able to teach. Able to teach. That's very important. Because a man who is not able to teach can't be qualified as an elder. If you're asked to submit someone's name to serve as an elder, if you're ever asked to do so, and that person has never taught, then he's not qualified. Right? That's one of the qualifications. I've been in places before where names were submitted for someone to serve as an elder, and the man had never taught before. Do we not read the qualifications? This is a very important one. Elders must be able to teach. Why? Go to Titus chapter 1. 1 Timothy 3 tells us that they must be able to teach. But in Titus, in him addressing the elders in chapter 1 of, his, of Paul's epistle to Titus, notice what he says in verse 9. It says that these men, it's elders in the context, should be holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. He's to keep the Word of God ever before him. It says holding fast the Word of life. What that means is, is an elder is going to be keeping God's Word right there before him all the time. That's his guide. What decisions do I need to make? What actions do I need to take? Well, the Word of God's going to guide me in that. I've always got it before me. Why? Because he can't know what to do if he doesn't do that. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul wrote to Timothy and told Timothy to be diligent, to be approved. A worker that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, I know Paul wrote that to Timothy, the evangelist. But how much more would that apply to elders of the local church who are to be able to effectively teach their brethren? They can't do so if they haven't diligently devoted themselves to a study of God's Word so they can rightly divide what God wants us to know, well, surely that would have to apply to them as well. There are men who have studied God's Word and continue to study God's Word so they can keep that before them as a guide. And we learn here from Titus that through this teaching of sound doctrine, elders can accomplish two things. The first of those things is they can exhort the brethren. All of you need to be exhorted, don't you? All of you need to be encouraged. We all do. We need to be encouraged to keep on keeping on, fighting this good fight that we're involved in. To keep on looking ahead toward that goal of going to heaven together and encourage one another to get there. You know what? Elders take sound doctrine and they do that. On the other hand, not only do they exhort, but they have to refute those who contradict truth. There are going to be times when your elders have to get up before you and have to contradict something that's been taught that wasn't true. They can't do that if they don't know what the truth is. And there are times that has to be done. And let me say this. There are times when elders are the most effective ones to do that. There are times when it's not as effective for me and Andrew to teach something as it would be for our shepherds to get up and teach it. That's why those men need to be able to teach. Because they can address a topic or deal with a situation. And when it comes from their mouths as the shepherds and the overseers, it's much more powerful than if it's coming from my mouth or Andrew's mouth. Because they're serving as an example. They're leading us. And not only are they leading us, they're leading us in information that they know and they're dedicated to. 
and they can well communicate that information to the flock so that the flock can understand why they're leading us in the way that they are. It's because the Lord asked us to. But they can't do that unless they've been able or apt to teach. Finally, we've already seen that. Finally, this is a very important point. The work of self-heeding. I want to go back to Acts 20 one more time. Acts chapter 20. I want you to notice verse 28 again. Paul says to these elders here, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to the flock. Did you catch that? The first thing he told them to take heed to was themselves. Take heed to yourself. So an elder must first examine himself. He must first look into himself and examine himself before he can look into someone else and examine another. I want to give you a passage from Romans chapter 2 that I want to read together with us. I realize that this passage in Romans chapter 2, Paul is directing it specifically in the context to the Jews. But we can read this And generally speaking, we can apply this to all areas of Christian life. That's Romans 2, beginning in verse 17. Let's read this together. Indeed, you are called a Jew, and rest on the law, and make your boast in God, and know His will, and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. Now, we can take that from the Jews and generally apply it to Christians, We can specifically apply that to elders of the local church and say, you who are called an elder, do you who teach others, who should guide others in this way, do you yourself do these things you're condemning them for? You see my point? That's a passage all about self-examination. It can apply to all of us. But how much more should it apply to those who shepherd the church of God? who are supposed to be lights and guiding others. The Jews were supposed to be that to the world. They were the ones who the oracles of God were delivered to first. They should have been a light and a teacher of those. They said they weren't. Instead, their actions caused them to blaspheme the name of God. And you know, I think we all understand, or maybe we all have known or seen Elders in the past who have just not lived up to who they should have been and and the terrible example that left and the problems that arose from that because they didn't first examine themselves. And that examination has to involve being consistent. Consistent how? Well, in the application of biblical principles, first and foremost, Paul told those elders to watch and to warn. Well, watch and to warn what? Just about false teaching? Or is there nothing else that needs to be watched and warned about? Well, there's a whole variety of things. Let me give you an example. Let's say that a group of elders is, is very staunch about making sure that modest dress is, is, is taught and encouraged and practiced among the local church. Oh, and they're, they're, really, they're really staunch about that, and they want that to be taught. They teach that themselves. They try to encourage people to do that. But at the same time, that group of elders may turn a blind eye to a marriage, divorce, and remarriage situation. Now, they may open the Bible and point to the Scriptures about modest stress and why we should do that and say, can't you see what the Holy Spirit said here? Oh, but they may have a situation where, you know, it may hurt some feelings and we may have some people leave over this other situation. We're just not going to say anything about that. Well, that inconsistency will tear your example all to pieces. It will cause more trouble in a local church than you can even think about. Believe you me, it will. 
consistency in the application of biblical principles. If I'm going to deal with this problem with the Scriptures, I've got to deal with this problem with the Scriptures. And I can't turn a blind eye to any issue. Why? Because I must be consistent. If not, the Word of God will be blasphemed because of me. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, in verse 20, and I'll let this, I'll close with this. In that same context where he's dealing with the elders there. In talking about them receiving double honor, he went on to say in verse 19, Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. Don't think about sinning elders very much, do you? but it's real. And an elder must take heed to himself so that he doesn't find himself saturated in a life of sin. We've all seen that, I'm sure. We all heard of a situation, I'm sure, to where you knew a man who served well. You knew a man who was an example and he was looked up to and respected. But all of a sudden one day, the curtain was pulled down and he found out that this man had been living an inconsistent life. He's soaked up and saturated in a life of sin and it's pitiful. What happened? What happened to him? He stopped looking into himself first. He stopped, he, he, he stopped taking heed to himself and to what God had taught him to be. And when that happens, it'll happen to all of us if not careful. But how much worse is it for those who are leading those in the path of righteousness? But when a man takes heed to himself, when he's consistent to examine himself in light of every biblical principle and to act upon that in regard to himself and to everyone else, then he can be sure. Not that he's going to be perfect. There are going to be times that they make mistakes. Listen, elders are going to make mistakes. But when they do make those mistakes, they'll acknowledge them and tell us, you know what, we're going to try to do better. We're not going to keep going down this path. Those are people who are taking heed to themselves. And when elders first take heed to themselves and examine themselves, then they're better equipped to examine the lives of the flock that they oversee. This statement here of Paul to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. It's a trustworthy statement. Any man, if any man aspires to the office of an overseer, it's a fine work that he desires to do. It's a fine work. Why is it a fine work? Jason, you've talked about some heavy stuff. You've talked about some things that, that just seem like they'd be really hard. Well, that's probably right. That's right. But you know what the local church is going to need in every age and in every generation? Men who see the need for God's people to be led in the proper path. Men who have a desire for that. Why do they have that desire for that? Because they see the need that God has asked for qualified men to lead the local church. And why is that a need? Because these people need help to get to heaven. And we're always going to need that. We're going to need men who can oversee us. We're going to need men who can rule over us well. We're going to need men who can teach us effectively. We're going to need men who can look into themselves and examine themselves and then look at us, examine us, and help us get to heaven. And may God help us to raise up men to continue to fill those spots. Thank you for your attention this morning. Thank you for your patience. I did take a little more time in doing this, but I thought it was important to do so. I initially had eight points. You only got four. This morning, we extend to you the Lord's invitation. We encourage you that if you have not made your life right with God, please see the importance of that. If you need to study about that, to learn more about that, please ask us. We're always willing to do that. We want to do whatever we can to help you get to heaven. If you've wandered off the path, please come. Let us help you make that right. If there's anything we can do, please come while we stand and we sing this song.